glad to see you back to Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, the show that looks into the compliance between the natural and the built environment. And that is so much more important in these days of COVID-19, where easy breezy and easy breezy seems to be the key. And we've been looking at architecture from our islands from the past and potentially for the future. And uh, that being said, uh, this is the volume three of the Manalani Magic Mountain show uh, with Larry Stricker, a partner in Killingsworth, Stricker, Lindgren, Wilson, and Associates. And we have you back from your vineyard in Napa Valley, California. Hi, Larry. Good to have you back. And, of course, we're having with us our co-host back in Honolulu, Hawaii, DeSoto Brown. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. And, Martin, you should be uh, introducing yourself as speaking from Germany. Thank you for adding that. That is so true. So we're from all over the world. And let's go to the first slide here, which is recapping where we had left last time. There's you, Larry, uh, bottom left, above your bus in France, um, at Killingsworth. And then we see a couple of quoting pictures from the last shows where we have actually been talking about the hotel, the Manalani Resort first, then the bungalows uh, second. And then the last show we did with uh, your business partner and friend, uh, Ron Lindgren, Larry, and he was sharing the shocking news that in your typology of hospitality design, uh, the percentage of projects built is only 15%. And that, especially you are the Soto, not from our discipline. That was shocking for you, but for me, having been in practice too, still am, uh, this is shocking as well because in other typologies, it's not quite as drastic. But uh, today, we actually want to share one of these who haven't made it yet to become real. And these are the Mamalani Grove. And can we get the next slide up? And you, Larry, please uh, orientate us uh, where they are and what we're looking at. Yeah, we see the uh, the main Manalani Hotel with the, uh, the bungalows on the far left. And then the to the right of the hotel is the 80-unit condominiums that we designed that opened uh, short about three years after the hotel. And then the circle that you see to the right of the condos is the the five-acre site that we'll be looking at for the grove. And immediately behind that, the the golf course. Yeah, and we should add that you are a proud resident of the apartment where you secured yourself a unit with a prime unit with prime view. And so this project here would have been your neighbors. And you had a guess why it didn't happen. Can you share that with us, please? Yeah, I, I think to, to the best of my recollection, the, uh, the, the uh, Japanese uh, representative that was, was bird-dogging the project did not uh, maybe com- complete all his uh, due diligence is once we had uh, designed the project, uh, completed construction drawings, had the uh, estimate from the contractor, had a building permit, and we're very close to starting. And uh, one, once, uh, I, th- I think there was a, a uh, someone forgot to, to discuss this with the golf management people since the, the project uh, Access to the project requires uh, access through the, the golf clubhouse property and and across the golf course. So that, that was the only reason I had ever heard that the project did not go ahead. But it uh, was it was unfortunate because it's a, it's a uh, would have would have been a very nice addition to the uh, to the uh, fish ponds. Yeah, and I think, and I think we, can, we can say, too, that when you look at this aerial photograph, you can see the configuration of the coastline and where the natural fish ponds are, but you also can see in between where the golf course is that this is all raw, 
untouched uh -uh lava, which is extremely rough and very rugged and very uninviting. So to turn that natural uh -uh lava into what we're about to look at is quite a feat. Yeah. And the golf course, by the way, is still carrying the name of its original owner, your ancestor. Yes, Francis H. I. Brown. Exactly. So the next slide, um, all the material we're showing uh, today is from uh, Ron every once in a while, even here or half around the world, sends me lovely things. And this one was a, a marketing brochure, I guess we would call it these days, of the uh, Monolani Grove. And I wish, you know, our media medium would be tactile because this is a wonderful brochure, very well done, very tactile, very finely made. And so now we want to flip through the brochure and next slide. And you, Larry, please uh, give us the background information of what we're seeing. Well, this, this is a very uh, soft sell, a nice uh, history of, of the island, some of the earlier uh, uh, Captain Cook discovering Hawaii, and then a lot of the I think it, it may be the, the next slide that, that shows the, uh, uh, some of the canoe paths or, or routes that were taken between the islands. And, and uh, you know, definitely the, uh, this area of the fish farms has always been a, uh, a, a secret and heavenly place uh, um, uh, for the Hawaiians. And I can only yeah, add that. Yeah, you go back to that one quickly, to the previous slide, Melissa. Can you go back? Yeah, thank you. Yes, Minnesota. I was just going to say that the uh, in this the the pages, the initial pages of this big brochure, this marketing brochure, has got the um, pictures of artifacts which come from Bishop Museum where I work. So the actual surviving pieces, some of these, come from Bishop Museum. And they are being used to emphasize the Hawaiian-ness of this very natural environment, which was just in the early stages of being developed um, at the time that we're talking about in 1990. And, and as you said earlier, Ron, I mean, uh, uh, Martin, right. we could date this brochure to coming from 1990, because based on the text yeah. that's on the first page. Yeah, and Perry, your point, Larry, it's, it's a nice soft sell because you, the Soto and I get annoyed when contemporary developers like Howard Hughes sort of more shamelessly use history to sell their projects, and they only point out pre-contact as if it never had been discovered by other people, and one of them here, or the, the first one, Captain Cook, is mentioned here, too, so it's a way more objective way to, uh, you know, set this, the historical stage. Let's go to the next slide here, uh, which um, is an illustration. Uh, well, that one we can skip over because we already talked about it. But the next one um, is, uh, Larry, uh, a sort of an illustrated um, animation of the siding of the actual five units, right? Yeah, there, there was a, a good slope to the site such that the, the three units that are closest to the fish farms are considerably you know, down at the, just, just about five feet above the water level. And then the, the unit, the two units beyond are sighted so that they, they look over top of the, uh, the, the lower units. And the, the total site was just, just under five acres. So there, there's, a, you know, Great views and, and a good sense of privacy and garden between between the units. As we get into the renderings, you'll see how how the privacy is so essential to the, the planning. Mm -hmm. and and let's go to the next slide. Orientation, yeah, and, and north is straight up. Uh, the the golf clubhouse would be to the to the right of the site plane. Yeah, and this is the side plan, and the text is hard to read, but I want to quote the beginning of it, which is along with the images of pre-contact. Uh, they dedicate one sentence. The beginning of their design consideration was that they observed the traditional way of wine living and the ali'i 
and basically set different parts of the building for different usages. And but that's all they say, and then they say since, or we say since culture has changed, but climate not. You guys were seeing this as still be appropriate and designing accordingly. And now let's get us oriented and, and explain to us kind of the zoning, the kind of the layout, which is very fascinating, Larry. Yeah, with, with the eight shape, you see the entry foyer coming into the center, and then to the left is the living, dining, kitchen, lunch, the utility area, and to the right, we, we have the terracing of, of the three bedrooms. So we, we enter at the mid-level and then go down to the lowest bedroom in Lanai, and then uh, up one flight to the uh, master, which actually uh, terraces back. So uh, we have a, a good-sized Lanai for, for most of the the master having the largest lanai. But um, again, as far as zoning, the, the three bedrooms were all with, with the ocean views on the right side and the living, dining, kitchen on, on the left. Absolutely. Let's go to the next slide. And um, all the illustrations that we're going to see uh, following are by the famed Carlos Denise that uh, you guys, Ron and you, had shared was almost your personal illustrator who has done work for other architects too, but you almost commissioned him for every drawing. And he has this, this beautiful sort of, um, you know, handwriting of uh, being so suggestive as far as tropical exotic. And, and explain us a little bit what we see. So here we're looking from the lagoon back at, at the uh, at the residence. On the left, we see the uh, the almost transparent living room, and on the right, the three levels of bedrooms, and then the the uh, the entry at the center, which overlooks the the lap pool and and the uh, lagoons beyond. And I wanted to say that in looking at this rendering, not only do I see the signature exposed protruding rafters of the Killingsworth look, particularly on the left, but also on the right, it really resembles part of the Halikulani Hotel, which had been designed about 10 years before this by our friend Ron. And as you pointed out, Larry, the, the double-hipped dicky roof that we see here was something that the Killingsworth firm had adapted by that time as one of also its uh, signature looks or signature elements for the buildings that it was designing here. Yeah, I think that, that was largely from, from the Halakalani, and we, we kind of make that a uh, part of our, our theme for all the low-rise buildings, the, uh, the bungalows, the canoe house restaurant, and then uh, carrying us through to the... Uh, the units here at the Grove. And we've also, as, as uh, Mark pointed out earlier too, we see the signature planter beds with bougainvillea vines, which is also something that was used not only at the Kahala Hilton Hotel, but also at the Halikulani Hotel. Yeah, and, and this is interesting because typologically it comes full circle to at beginning work in the early 60s where Conrad Hilton had discovered him and, you know, then they started to do resorts together. And this is coming full circle to one story or a single story or a few story residential, but it has evolved and emerged. And we were once making you guys the compliment as the best postmodern architect because you weren't cynical. Um, you were, you know, eye winking and the Dickey roofs are sort of referential, but, you know, they make a lot of sense. And while Ed had started out as the flat roof mid-century guys, you had been sort of sneaking that into the repertoire. Yes, right. Pretty cool. And let's go to the next slide, which gets us actually into the building. And let's discuss this a little bit, Larry. Yeah, well, you enter through a, a very lush garden, and then we have the, uh, the post and beam trellis, and the, uh, the the cap over the the entry, and that's that's kind of the the, the center to 
going to the right, we go to the living dining wing, and to the left, to the bedroom wing. So again, uh, you, you come through here, and, and the, your first uh, impression is on the, you'll see on the next slide, you, you see the, the lagoons beyond, and, the, and then the ocean in the, in the background. So the, the whole sense of uh, a place of, of being, you know, in in the uh, the lushness of the lagoons and the, and the privacy. I think it it, uh, it it really takes hold of the site and and puts puts you in, in touch with the, the the specialness of the lagoons. And I can also say too that that atrium, as you walk in, is another Killingsworth um, seeing element of the very high ceiling there because it looks like it's almost a two-story entryway with, with these very high windows and curtains that extend all the way from the, from the ceiling down to the floor. And that really reminds me of the Kahala Hilton lobby as well. Yeah, and as we were characterizing that, it's intentionally the absence of architecture for the presence of nature, and what clearly proves that you guys are, you know, modernists and have been trying to stay away from postmodern in its sort of, uh, you know, true sense is that the, that, that the fountain, I stole the anecdote already, isn't just uh, a decorative fountain, as you were questioning that to Soto, but it's multi-purposely a jacuzzi, and the brochure it says, by the push of a button, it turns from a fountain to a jacuzzi. So that's a very kind of a modern, again, eye-winking kind of performance element there. Let's go to the next slide here, which is uh, maybe the most telling because that's kind of the, the gathering room, the outdoor room that is almost entirely outside and, and just has the main roof as the protection from what we need to protect us from, which is the sun and the rain. But otherwise, as you said, Larry, you feel like you're out there, right? Uh, it's definitely a transparent space and, and completely wrapped by the, the lushness of the, the gardens around the lagoon. Uh, it, it really, you, you see the, the density of the palm trees. And the, the palm is just, just uh, you know, continue. But during the early construction, we actually removed some of moved some of the palms, you know, for use out of where on the site. So it was a they're kind of like a, a nursery for palm trees. So and it still has kept that that look. Yeah. And you just sort of were questioning the mitigation of elements when it storms as we were just been lucky again to not get hit by Hurricane Douglas. And that's yes. illustrated well in the next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, again go, stepping down to the lower lanai where there'd be a, a cocktails and outdoor cooking area, and we see the, the treatment of the glazing. Again, we're looking at uh, a ten foot high uh, glass line, and then the additional height in the center of the uh, of the living space. But uh, again, uh, the openness uh, to to the lagoon and the and the landscaping. And let's go dining. It's about dining time. So next slide, and there's a little bit of a surprise. And explain this, this that. This is meant to be more of a, uh, a formal space, so it is. Uh, uh, it, it would have a, a side view up to one of the golf holes, and uh, uh, the, the kitchen would be to the right, and then the living space we just looked at to the left. So there, there are. So when we when we see the axonometric uh, drawing, we'll see that there there are actually three alternatives: a, a breakfast one eye off the kitchen. There's this the formal dining room that we're looking at now. And then also a, a cocktail outdoor dining area down at the lower level, closest to the lagoon. 
this is and after we have this ni- nice meal, I think we're all tired. Let's go to bed and go to the next slide for that. <laughs> So that's the bedroom. So we're, we're looking at the uh, the master bedroom, and uh, we're, we're, we'll see. Very uh, fairly enclosed. It would have uh, the one wall facing the outside of the H, but again, would look into the uh, uh, the landscaping. And then looking back from where we are, it opens to the, the next slide, showing the uh, study or sitting area and the, uh, the out, outdoor lanai and uh, lagoons beyond. So I, uh, again, going from a, a more private or enclosed uh, sleeping area to a, a semi-open uh, study or uh, lounge area and then to the the uh, uh, sunning uh, lanai. So it's a nice uh, progression of, of uh, space for the, the master, master suite. And there also are these very high ceilings. We don't have flat interior uh, ceilings in these rooms, but we go up into what is actually the exterior roof space to give them a, a much more airy and dramatic and elegant look, too. Uh, a lot of these spaces are, are like I said, reminiscent of uh, the, some of the, the uh, main buildings at the, uh, at the Hala Kalani, the right. House of the Key. And- Right. And right. Uh, very, very Hawaiian in character. Right. And if we go back for a second to the previous slide, uh, we see something else, which is a very traditional device to mitigate our tropical uh, well-being, which is a ceiling fan. So, again, uh, the cross breeze and the ceiling fan and hot air rising up and the fan basically taking it out. So these houses are, are very comfortable, um, would have been very comfortable, and we know from your other projects, which are very bioclimatic, so this is just another example for that. So let's go to the uh, slide after the next slide. We'll jump over one, this one here. This is a great uh, exonometric uh, explosion uh, drawing here that sort of subsidizing everything you have been talking about, but uh, you know, illustrating it in an even better way and gives us a better clue than in the plan where they sort of extract the floor plans in showing the cleverness of space planning with a sort of split level strategy that you had explained, right? That it's actually in part a multi story building that never feels that way. It feels like a very gentle flow of, 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 of spaces and places, right? Yeah, I think from from the uh, from the entry, and then you can see the, uh, the the small roof on the on the tallest element, the, which is actually the entry. But you're you're coming in at the mid level, so that that space, the uh, the uh, arrangement of the roof forms, still so, uh, and the terracing of the lanais, uh, you know. It, it's not a box in the building. It kind of moves with the, the slope of the land. So it, uh, I think the zoning and all really shows well here in this axonometric. Uh, with the, uh, yeah. And then going from, from the lagoon facing lanai back into the building from, from the more open areas to the, the more private areas. Yeah. And Larry, these these buildings were never built, but did you design any homes or other buildings on the site that were sort of similar to these? Uh, not really. The, uh, I, I found that I, I had, uh, actually, he was uh, with, with the, uh, originally 
my uh, hotel consultant with the Hala Kalani, uh, Jack Hudson, and he had a loft right at the uh, 18th tee. And uh, he, he wanted, wanted uh, a, uh, a single story home, again, with the similar uh, uh, dicky roofs, uh, very Hawaiian feeling, and high ceilings. And uh, while that was under construction, a, uh, a, a great cardiologist that had bought a property uh, a few uh, lots away, and, and he was taken with the design of his first home. So we, we uh, did a, uh, a second home for his uh, doctor. And uh, very folks, very different. Uh, the, the home for the doctor was, again, just a single-story home, but it yeah. had similar zoning to uh, to what we have here at the Glory. Right. Okay, so us running out of time, uh, let's phase out with the Soto sharing with us, uh, although while although you guys had closed down your office, but let's illustrate why your legacy lives on and get to the next slide for that and please so share this, with us the uh, Soto. So, uh, Martin, you said that this was a, a preliminary design for potential uh, use of uh, the uh, Office of Hawaiian Homes, which would have been for people of 50% or more Hawaiian ethnicity to be able to build on their properties. Is that right? Is that, was this, was this was uh, That's for correct for DHL, yeah. Yeah, DHL, and yeah. Uh, you unknowingly, we used a very similar plan, an H shape. You've got an entryway, although the entryway is not decorative. It would have been for potentially um, having fish that you could eat. But basically, although it's a very scaled-down version, it's somewhat like what we just looked at for a very affluent clientele versus a very down-home and um, back-to-the-land type of clientele. Yeah, and as uh, you know, Ron had shared with us, Larry, that uh, there was a project by Ed, an early project where he was doing courtyard houses for um, for Latin American. Uh, low-income people, you know, we can see this in the tradition of, again, sort of uh, proletarizing, you know, your your guys kind of strategy. And um, let's go to the last page now. Um, this is a sunset view here from that beautiful piece of land. And then we threw in the note that after the $200 million renovation, which you attended its reopening, Larry, it's uh, like everything in Hawaii uh, had to close down because of the COVID pandemic soon after that. And that's obviously a bummer and, and tragic. But we know from Ron that actually the owner of the Halikani that we talked quite a bit about, they take advantage, uh, they make a virtue out of the dilemma and say they keep uh, the hotel close, the Halikani, to do some uh, long overdue renovations. And we're hoping these are going to be mechanical ones and not aesthetical ones, and they stay to the original. So that means in some cases, if clients are affluent enough, they might have some money to be able to do some things. And our suggestion is here, no surprise, why don't you build the Maunalani Grove project? <laughs> because if anything, aren't they very COVID compensating compliant, right? Well, they have a lot of air it's circulation, true. Absolutely. So with that, uh, we're at the end of the show, but we're going to see you back, Larry, uh, next week and the week after to actually share with us the last project that you guys have done on the Hawaiian Islands. And that one is the one that you had been the project architect again, and that's the Ihilani Resort. So stay tuned for that. And until then, once again, stay as tropically exotic as Ed and Ron, and you, Larry, and easy breezy and easy breezy. Be safe and sound. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Very good.